Hello everyone, my name is Valentina and today I'll be discussing everything we learned during week two in both the rhetorical acts as well as in the reading pop culture book. In the rhetorical acts textbook, we mainly learned about the seven different categories to being critically aware and becoming a critical thinker while reading different sources. The first one being purpose, as in what was the author's purpose or the speaker's purpose? What message were they trying to portray? And then audience, who is the author? or the speaker speaking to? Are they speaking to a community, a family member, the United States? And then persona is who is the person? Who is the author? Who is the speaker? Are they a member of the community? Are they the president? And then tone is how did they sound while giving their speech? How did the, how did the piece of work they created sound? Was it happy, fearful? connected, disconnected, and then evidence is what supporting materials did they use to support their claim? And then structure is how did the reader or not the reader, how did the author or the speaker line up their work? Did they start with ESOS, Logos, Passos, and then do claim evidence analysis? Did they just skip ESOS, Logos, Passos? Really, the whole main point of the structure is really to understand what the infants, if they were really trying to give an emphasis in anywhere in their reading or their speech, which also leads to strategies. Did What did they use to emphasize? How did they really grab their reader's attention? Once we really learned the seven different categories to being a critical reader to help us be critically aware of works, we got into our first article, which was actually an opinion column written by Benjamin Barber called Overselling Capitalism with Consumerism. In his column, he considers consumerism and the decline of ethical hard work and the loss of one's gratification. He talks a lot about how capitalism has changed the mind of consumers. We all know that consumerism is very necessary in order to keep the economy afloat. But a line is, needs to be drawn in the way capitalism and brands have really infiltrated one's personal life through the branding and ads, not to mention the hoax of messages that these brands are creating in their ads. Um, this article by um, Barber actually really turns into the next article that we read, which was, um, with these words, I can sell you anything by William Lutz. In this article, he basically describes, like, he basically tells us meanings of different words that are often portrayed in advertisements and behind brands. The first one is being helped. For example, a lot of medications or relief medicine, I guess you could say, uses the word help, like helps relieve cold symptoms, help, helps relieve um, sore muscles. What people don't understand is that they only really look at the word help, but they don't look at the whole sentence, helps relieve, helps relieve what, and stuff. And it's also like, it's like a, it's kind of like a meaningless word, help, helping what? One, how does cough medicine help relieve your cold symptoms? Like what, what area of your body is this helping? And people really don't understand the meaning. And unless you know the scientific meaning of every little thing of medicine, is it really going to have an actual meaning to you? Um, also, the word relief also doesn't mean that it's going to get rid of all your symptoms. It's not going to get rid of all your sore muscles. It's just going to prolong the symptoms for a short period of time. People only see the word help and really are just like, yes, I want it. I need it. The next one is virtually spotless. It's not saying that there's a definite promise that your dishes or your glasses are going to be clean. It's just saying that virtually they will almost be gone, but you can still probably see them in the end, but they're just not going to be as noticeable. And then um, let's actually explain the word virtually in essence of effect, although not in fact. So it doesn't mean it's going to in fact leave them spotless, but virtually. Virtually, you're not going to see them as much, but it doesn't mean all your spots on your dishes are going to be clean. That Windex you use doesn't mean that all of your spots on your window, all the dirt on your window, is going to be completely impossible to see. The next one is new and improved. This one is actually really tricky because there's like there's laws and regulations behind it. So in order to make something new, 
regulation wise it means that something inside the product actually needs to be changed you can't just put new and improved and then just because it was distributed a year later that's not new what means new is um, let's use the example of the soap company that added lemon um, lemon smell to their soap that's new because technically it changes the chemical um, formula of the product however it doesn't really mean it's new it just means hey we added lemon to it so now your dish soap will smell like lemons instead of fragrance free and then improved is kind of a, it's not a tricky one it's just really is a hoax um, improved means we can change the design and call it improved it's not actually improved at all the only thing that's different is hey our bottle might look different instead of like a squeeze bottle it's gonna be like a pump bottle the next word is going to be works. This one is actually used a lot in toothpaste ads, at least this is what I connected it to, is toothpaste ads. Um, a lot of, um, specifically like Crest and stuff, it says, this toothpaste works against fluoride, this toothpaste helps whiten your teeth. And then also charcoal toothpaste, it says, works better than normal toothpaste. It helps whiten teeth better than this toothpaste. However, it's also meaningless. Works how. Do you act, does it actually work is the real question. Do you ever notice that your teeth are actually wider or are you just buying it because the company is saying that this charcoal toothpaste may be better than Crest whitening strips or whatever, whitening toothpaste. Next, um, The next article we read was um, Toys by Roland Bars. This one was actually really interesting to read as I don't really pay attention to toys. Um, in the... In the article, Barth talks a lot about how toys these days tend to resemble adult life, like, but miniature size for kids. So instead of like a full size adult kitchen, you have like a little plastic kitchenette for your kid. And then also dolls that take the role of parenting's hands into a child's hand with dolls that can quite disgustingly eat food and then its bowels work somehow. Um, and then also, he also talks about the difference between wood and plastic toys. A lot of um, toys these days are made out of plastic and have really bad chemicals in them. And so he talks a lot about that as well. That's like the basis of his, is talking about the resemblance of adult life with children's toys. And then as well as plastic versus wood toys. Personally, I prefer wood toys, grew up them with them, so I couldn't say much about plastic toys. The next article was Craving the Other by Soli Ho. Um, in this one, it talks a lot about Americanizing cuisine. Um, Soli Ho, um, I don't know if I'm saying that right, but I'm my bad if I butchered that. But she talks a lot about how she came from Vietnam and she's a Vietnamese immigrant and how she was trying to fit in with American culture. But as she was trying to fit in by Americanizing her Vietnamese cuisine that her grandma or her mom would make her, she noticed that a lot of cuisines these days are actually Americanized. Like for instance, she went to a Chinese restaurant and they had like cilantro on a Chinese cuisine dish, which I guess really isn't the case these days. Like ch normal Chinese cuisine probably would not have cilantro on it. Um, and then also, I wanted to add into this because I personally have experienced this. I used to work at Mendocino Farms, and we had a pork belly banh mi and a Peruvian steak on the menu. The Peruvian steak being a Peruvian dish as well. And then the vegan uh, the pork belly banh mi being a Vietnamese dish. They were both really Americanized, and the company itself would actually use the word elevate a lot, which Soli Ho talks a lot about, is how companies will use the word elevate to basically mirror Americanizing the food. The next article is In Praise of Chain Stores by Virginia Pastrell. In this article, it's kind of eye-opening to really see how much people actually care about chain stores and restaurants. Um, she talks a lot about how in every city and every state there seems to be all the same chain stores, all the same restaurants, such as the example she uses is Gap, um, Target, uh, Anthropology, Urban Outfitters, and then for restaurants she uses like P.F. Chang's, McDonald's, um, California Pizza Kitchen, and then she also, not only does she explain how these chain stores and restaurants are infiltrating everywhere and stuff, but she also talks about how people are willingly able to move because of this, which is kind of crazy that people will 
decide their whole life based on what stores are in that state or that city that they're living in and she talked about how a lot of people were willing to move for their jobs because the state that they were moving to happened to have these same chain stores and same chain restaurants the next article we read was snaps to riches by ellen hewitt um, she talks a lot about how people on Vine were becoming influencers and then were being reached out by brands and creating seven second advertisements for them, which when Vine ended, a lot of people started moving to Snapchat. And on Snapchat, the whole advertisement from influencers continued, but a little bit on a bigger scale. Um, for instance, um, Hewitt talks a lot about this one influencer, I forgot his name, but he did like a snapchat takeover at disneyland and then as well as other um snapchat influencers or influencers in general were being reached out by brands to make and they were making bank doing this apparently and they were making little advertisements they were making snapchat advertisements all creative and decorative and getting paid to do it and then as well as tiktok and youtube there's a lot of advertisements going on through there with different influencers and like a little bit longer on YouTube and describing the product and explaining why they like it and then getting paid by the company to do these little videos. The next thing we learned was public displays for transaction. Um, in this article we learned about how we, you can really tell someone's life through money transactions. For example, she talked. Um, they talked a lot about Venmo for example, where on Venmo it's like public and you can see what your friends are doing and who they're paying and all their comments that they put on their money transactions. And she t um, they talk about uh, the story of how the girl was able to, her friend was able to see her boyfriend and girlfriend's like whole relationship through the way they spent their money, how they split their bills, how they both chipped in to pay for a couch. And then one day how those transactions to each other stopped, assuming that they both broke up. And then the girl started sending money to this new guy and then assume they were dating because they started splitting things again and it's really interesting to see how you can honestly it's interesting and creepy actually in a sense that you can actually see how people are spending their lives through the way they spend their money and who they're hanging out with and who they're talking to anyways that's it for week two.